who was the mysterious author behind the 1954 book Flying Saucer from Mars? And was there any truth to be found within its pages? This is the second part of my investigation into the Lossy Mouth incident. I have linked part one in the description for anyone who hasn't yet seen it, as it lays the foundation of this curious tale, The Lossy Mouth Incident, part two, the author. In 1986, Christopher Allen and Stuart Campbell, both journalists working for the Magonia magazine, began to research Mr. Allingham's strange encounter and would bring to light multiple new insights regarding the case. The pair would follow a similar line of investigation to that of Chapman. They too thought that the encounter and the book were a hoax, but did not believe that Mr. Allingham was the author. In fact, they didn't think the English ornithologist ever actually existed. They had received information from an informant who indicated that a well-known public figure was actually the person to write Allingham's book, but the informant would not reveal the man's identity. From the pair's own research into the case, they suggested that the real author must have a background in astronomy. In the book, there was reference to both the Journal of the British Interplanetary Society and the Journal of the British Astronomical Association. Neither of these sources were available to the public in 1954, so it could be assumed that the author was a member of one of these societies. However, no Mr. Allingham appears on the membership list at the time. The mystery author was also familiar with the recent work of active lunar astronomers, like H. Percy Wilkins and Patrick Moore. Even before this investigation, there had been mention of some similarities between Moore and Allingham's writing style. Allingham, on multiple occasions, referenced Moore's research and books. On one occasion, they were said to have met at a lecture given to a Tunbridge Wells UFO club. Moore was one of very few people to meet Allingham in person and claimed to know him. It was a combination of all these facts that led to Patrick Moore being the prime suspect in this case. Now it's possible, some of you might not know of Mr. Moore and his work, but here in Britain he was an extremely popular and recognisable figure from television. Patrick Moore was an English amateur astronomer who had made quite the name for himself in the field of astronomy. As a writer, researcher and television presenter, he was most well known for the television series The Sky at Night, a documentary programme on astronomy produced by the BBC. We've been hearing a great deal about the inner planets, but what about those remote members of the Sun's family, Uranus, Neptune and Pluto? They are not spectacular, but I sometimes feel they are rather neglected because they are fascinating worlds. And this is a good time for talking about them because they are all on view now and they are all pretty near opposition. Moore presented The Sky at Night from 1957 to 2013. You heard right, for 56 years, Moore worked tirelessly to educate the British public on all matters astronomical. For his work in education, Moore was knighted in 2001. On the matter of UFOs and alien encounters, Moore was incredibly sceptical, but did believe in the possibility of the existence of alien life forms. Well, there are plenty of things that are visible in the sky that can't immediately be explained away. My whole point is that there's not the slightest evidence that any of these things come from outer space. And after all, why do you search for a crazy explanation when there are plenty of reasonable ones to hand? What are some of the reasonable ones? Well, we have many of these reports, for example, from aircraft pilots. And I've no doubt that some of these are due to classified aircraft. I'm not qualified to say any more than that, obviously, but I'm sure this is so. Then we have bits of satellite debris re-entering, and no one knows quite when these are coming, or how they are coming, or where they are coming. And uh, if they're irregular in shape, and they come back into the atmosphere, then clearly they spiral about a bit. Then we have things such as ice crystals in the sky, and I've seen plenty of those myself, because I was a wartime flyer. Birds, bats, balloons, searchlight beams, all kinds of things. Do you think that uh, in the years to come you may change your opinion on this, uh, Patrick? I don't think I will. Mind you, I'm always open to conviction, and if we don't get any proof whatever that UFOs or flying saucers or whatever you call them do come from beyond the Earth, I shall be the first to cheer. 
annoy you that the, the, your serious study of the stars is interpreted by Mystic Meg or whoever it is? No, no, it? we always get nuts. I mean, you're, you're with the way you sit down. There's even a flat Earth society, you know. Yes. Also, a society of people in Germany who believe the Earth to be the inside of a hollow sphere. Yeah. I put them in touch with the flat Earth society. They're now fatting it out. <laughs> so why would this man create such an elaborate hoax in 1954? Well, simply put, Moore was a well-known practical joker. He admitted sending a hoax UFO sighting to his local newspaper to study the public reaction. He invented an Australian rocket expert named Dr. Robert Randall who claimed to have seen a UFO crash landing. But his most magnificent joke occurred in 1976. It was on the morning of April Fool's Day that Moore made an announcement on BBC Two Radio he informed the public that an extraordinary astronomical event was about to take place. At precisely 9.47am, the planet Pluto would pass directly behind Jupiter in relation to the Earth. This unbelievably rare event would mean that the gravitational forces of the two planets would combine for a brief period. During this time, the so-called Jovian-Plutonian gravitational effect would counteract Earth's own gravity. Moore told listeners, that if they were to jump at precisely 9.47am, they would experience a strange floating sensation. At 9.48am on April 1st, 1976, thousands of people from all around the world called into BBC Radio 2 to inform them that the experiment was a success and many of the listeners floated for some time. One Dutch woman suggested that she and her husband flew around the room Another caller had floated to the ceiling, along with some friends and every item in the house. Obviously, this announcement was an April Fool's prank, but it did show just how easy it was to trick a vast number of people. Later, when Moore was questioned about this incident, he stated it had been intended to spoof recent pseudoscientific theories, such as the one found in the popular book, The Jupiter Effect. Some more evidence backing up the claim that the flying saucer from Mars was in fact written by Mr. Moore was his connection to the publisher, Frederick Muller Limited. Moore had worked with the company to publish the books Worlds Around Us and Sons, Myths and Men. Both of these works were published in 1954, the same year that Cedric Allingham had published his book with the same company. But that is not all. When Allingham's book was compared with a selection of Moore's books, ranging from 1950 to 1980. It was noted that on more than 24 separate occasions, identical words or phrases were used to describe specific scientific or astronomical events, such as the descriptions of the canals on Mars, reference to Atlantis, Professor Lowell's study of Mars, the ashen light of Venus, the discoveries of Galileo, and many more. These accounts would certainly go some way in showing that Patrick Moore may have created Allingham and his encounter as some form of prank or to show the gullibility of the UFO community at the time. But could this be proven? In 1984, Reverend Andrew Morton, a pioneer in stylometry, investigated the similarities between Moore and Allingham using his stylometric method. Stylometry is the study of linguistic style it is commonly used to attribute authorship to anonymous or disputed writings. It works by using computational analysis to compare multiple pieces of writing, then through the use of complex statistical methodologies, determines if those pieces were written by the same author. This was clearly the perfect tool to validate the theory that Cedric Allingham was just a pen name for Patrick Moore. The study took place in the University of Edinburgh First, two 1,000-word samples from Allingham's book were compared with samples from Moore's books that were published around the same time. The analysis was inconclusive. Morton suggested that the authors were not identical, stating that it was very unlikely that one author had written both samples. This halted the investigation of Moore for the time being. The scope of the study was increased to include other potential candidates. They were made up from a selection of UFO writers, popular in the 1950s. As a control parameter for the experiment, science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke was also included in the study. Surprisingly, the experiment determined 
that only one of the writers presented no significant difference in writing style to that of Allingham. That writer was Arthur C. Clarke, the experimental control. Clarke was contacted to give his statement on the results of the analysis. He replied saying that he was highly offended that anyone should think he had any involvement with a UFO hoax. He had spent much of his time battling against what he called UFO nonsense. Like any good scientist, Morton devised a stricter, stylometric test with fewer variables. This time only Clark and Allingham would be compared, and the samples of text would be far larger than in the initial experiment. At the conclusion of this test, Morton found that although the samples did show many similarities, that they were not of a statistically significant level, meaning that Morton substantiated Clark's denial and determined that Clark did not write the book Flying Saucers from Mars. But if it wasn't Clark or Moore, or the many authors that took part in the experiment, who was it? The pair of journalists were now at a dead end trying to identify the author. But around this time, three people from the Tunbridge Wells UFO Club came forward and claimed they were witnesses to Allingham's lecture. It had taken place on the 3rd of January in 1955. All of the witnesses told the same tale. Allingham and an assistant gave a presentation on his encounter and UFOs. During this lecture, the speaker made it known that he was suffering from some kind of illness. The journalists thought it may be possible to find this assistant of Allingham's. So they began a new line of investigation. First they contacted the publisher, Frederick Muller Limited, which by 1986 had become the Muller Blonde and White Publishing Company. The company still would not reveal the address or the identity of the author, but did say that they would forward any correspondence to the address they had on file. So the pair wrote to Allingham and his assistant, asking them to come forward and identify themselves. After many weeks of waiting, the publisher returned the pair's letter. It had been marked not known at this address. This was an amazing breakthrough in the investigation, as when the publishers returned the letter, they had left the forwarding address in the envelope. Their contact was a Mr. Peter Davis, who lived in Oxted. Could this be the real Allingham? Davis was traced to Seven Oaks in Kent and agreed to be interviewed by the pair. He told them he was a journalist and he had been involved with the writing of Flying Saucer from Mars and that the encounter was fake and the book a hoax. Davis told the pair the book had two authors, himself and one other man who he would not name. These two men would share the royalties from the book. The accomplice wrote an original draft for the book. It was then given to Davis to revise and complete. Davis also admitted to being the person shown on the cover of the book, albeit in disguise, complete with a fake moustache. He was also the one who had shown up to the Tunbridge Wells UFO Society in January 1955 to give the lecture. The assistant was the unnamed co-author, who was there to help with any scientific questions, since he knew much more about the subject than Davis. So it was now clear that the book was a lie, and that Allingham was a purely fictional character. But there was still one mystery that eluded the journalists from the Magonia magazine. Who was the accomplice, the co-author of the book, the man with a deep understanding of astronomy? and links to multiple academic societies. Allen and Campbell now returned to their original prime suspect, Patrick Moore, but this time the pair had more evidence. It was known that Peter Davis, one of the authors of the book, had been old friends with Moore during the time the book was written. Davis's home in Oxted was less than nine miles from Moore's home in East Grinstead. Both of their homes were also not far from the Tunbridge Wells UFO Society. The knowledge of multiple authors helps to explain why the stylometric examination did not confirm Moore's authorship. Davis's revision of the book may have been enough to cover or obscure much of Moore's style, yet some of the astronomers' idiosyncrasies shone through. Davis admitted he was not well versed in scientific theory or astronomy, meaning that in many of the more detailed explanations or references to previous astronomical work, the writing style and language of Moore became much more apparent. This would explain the similar descriptions of scientific phenomena 
which were present in both Moore and Allingham's work. One final piece of evidence, identified by Allen and Campbell, was found in the cover of the book itself. The picture of Allingham, who we now know to be Peter Davis, next to a large telescope. When that picture is compared with a picture of Moore's large telescope in his garden, you would see that the telescopes are identical. But not only that, the garden, the shrubs, the shed, and the trees are all identical as well. Allen and Campbell concluded that, without a doubt, Patrick Moore was the author of Flying Saucer from Mars. The pair of journalists certainly put forward quite a convincing point, but I feel that there is still some unanswered questions. Firstly, in all the years since the book was published, Patrick Moore has never claimed to have written the book. It's possible that his sense of humour and love of practical jokes got out of hand. The book became too popular and he was embarrassed to admit the hoax. To me this seems unlikely, as Mr Moore in the past has owned up to many of his pranks and was usually quite happy to talk about them. If it was indeed done to measure the public's susceptibility to hoaxes and tricks, then it makes no sense to deny writing the book, as only once the book is proven false can any real data be gained from the deception or any lessons learned. But what about the, the what about the real eccentrics, the flat earthers and the people like that? I mean, uh, how do you feel about I that? I have the very greatest sympathy for them, I may say. And after all, don't forget, many, many years ago, there was a man named Copernicus. And Copernicus said, the uh, earth doesn't, the, uh, the sun does not go around the earth, the earth goes around the sun. And everyone said he was a crank. But of course, um, uh, the earth does go around the sun, at least I think it does. <laughs> how can one tell? Yes, I have every great sympathy for the, what I call the independent thinker. And I say, I would hate to see them vanish from the Earth. Oh, the flat earthers, the hollow globers, the coal sunners, the astrologers, the flying sorcerers. I, I, I think it's a jolly good thing. But what about people who say they've seen, they've seen Martians and people like that? Uh, interesting point there. Do you remember, long, long time ago, 1938, uh, when there was a misleading broadcast of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds mm. over in America. Mm. And um, people thought the Earth had been invaded by Martians. And people, you know, actually rang up to say they'd seen the Martians and their heat rays and their fighting machines. Yes. It's very interesting indeed. And I'm sure this accounts for quite a lot of flowing sources. Yes, you mean that people uh, would like to, uh, to imagine that they've seen them? Well, I, mean, I don't know whether you really want to imagine Martians with heat rays. I certainly don't. But um, they certainly thought they'd, saw, they'd seen them. Mm. No, it's just true. Once the 1986 July edition of Magonia magazine had been released, Moore threatened to sue the publishers for slander. On another occasion, Moore pulled out of a live television appearance when he was told he would be questioned on Cedric Allingham. Could he truly be the author of the book? It would seem to me that Cedric Allingham's encounter was most probably a hoax. There are many telling signs and the pictures have been debunked by many people on a number of occasions. It's possible the UFO was made from some old Coleman lanterns. Since the craft Allingham saw was so similar to that of Adamski's, it's possible that they were built in the same way. It was suggested in Yankee magazine that Adamski's UFO was nothing more than an old Chrysler hubcap, a coffee can and two ping pong balls. The true mystery in this case is not one of aliens or UFOs, but one of terrestrial creatures and a secretive identity. Who wrote this curious tale of a spaceman landing in Lossiemouth, and why? Thank you for listening 